thing. So those kinds of rituals are fine. But your, your routine there sounds perfectly fine. You know? And if the puppy seems particularly spunky, you could do more another training session if you wanted, right? So you train with the puppy a little bit, put the puppy up for a while, take the puppy out again to go to the bathroom, and after that the puppy seems energetic. Like, then if you wanted to do another session, you could, right? So let the dog dictate. You'll see um, uh, how the dog does with multiple training sessions in a day, and that's one of the things you'll figure out. Some puppies support it, and other puppies don't, right? And what I would want for everybody at this stage is to be aware of when your puppy seems into it and not into it, and don't force it when they're not into it which is something that people struggle with in the beginning. You know, I want to train, my puppy's not going to get better if I don't train, but it's really unproductive training time if you're trying to do it when the puppy's head's not in the right space. And so it's one of those things you can't really force. So start to feel out what it feels like. And you, I'm sure you're getting an idea already, right? Everyone should be getting an early idea like, okay, wow, you're, you're into it right now. The whole energetics are better, whether it's because you're jumping on me or you're taking the food harder or there's less looking around in between rewards, all the kind of stuff that we use as potential indicators for how into it the dog is. Pay special attention to that. And so if you want to bring your dog puppy out multiple times for little short sessions in a day and watch their energetics throughout those sessions, and maybe by session three, not so much, right? Your puppy's kind of going through the motions or a little checked out. That's a sign that three a days aren't for you at this stage, right? And that will change, right? So one of the things when we talked about kind of balance in our routines, of, in everything, right, in all aspects, that changes. So you're lots of puppies that appear to be relatively unmotivated at certain stages, especially younger puppies, come on at different stages, right? So there's some really interesting studies. Uh, there's a, 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 um, a biologist, actually, uh, that named Raymond Coppinger. And so Ray Coppinger was uh, a biologist at Hampshire College in Massachusetts, and he was into dogs and the evolution of the domestic dog and uh, dog biology. And he used his grad students while he was still alive to do studies on dogs the way biologists would study wolves or whatever, right? And so he followed feral packs of dogs in South America. They did studies on livestock guardian dogs and on herding breeds and a variety of things like that. So he has a, a one book called uh, Dogs that he wrote with his wife. And there's a whole series of how, um, um, how Dogs Work is another one of his books. They're great. And I saw him lecture various times. I'm a super entertaining guy. And he discusses the evolution of the domestic dog as dogs aren't wolves, this whole this whole kind of thing, and he talks about more plausible explanations for the, uh, the evolution of the domestic dog. But on top of that, he talks about, um, for instance, predatory sequences in dogs, right? And predatory sequence is a biologically driven sequence in a dog, right? It's what wild canids and the precursors of modern dogs did to stay alive while they were still potentially hunting at various stage, stages. And so there's a, a biologically defined predatory sequence where the animal orients towards movement, stalks, chases, bites, kills, dissects, eats, right? So the biologists have defined all the pieces of this puzzle, right? And so, and those behaviors are innate, right? And he talks a lot about uh, genetic traits as being like switches, and that they come on at different times for different dogs, right? And so the classic example he uses is the difference between herding dogs, border collies, who they were studying, and livestock guardian dogs, these big mastiff type dogs, uh, Anatolian Shepherds and Kuvas and Great Pyrenees and all these breeds that were designed to stay with the sheep and guard the sheep, right? And border collies like to chase stuff a lot, and livestock guardians hopefully don't like to chase stuff too much because it's not a good thing if your sheepdog is chasing a rabbit out of the pasture and disappears over the hill somewhere chasing rabbits, they should stay with the sheep. So they want them to be territorial and protective of their territory, but not highly predatory, right? And so <clears throat> we think, okay, the livestock guardians don't have much prey drive. And Coppinger talks and he says, well, it's not so much that. He says it's that the switch for predatory behavior turns on really early with border collies at six weeks old or five weeks old, it'll, their desire to chase things that are moving, that switch is already flipped. 
So they have all this time to rehearse that behavior while their brain's developing. We already talked about critical developmental periods, right, in dogs. And so their brain it would kick on, and all the time that they're in the litter and out for that, there's lots of opportunities for them to practice chasing behavior. And if they do, that becomes kind of a piece of their lifetime behavioral repertoire. It becomes kind of hardwired into them. Livestock guardians, on the other hand, this, they're slower maturing. And so their switch doesn't kick on as early. And it doesn't kick on typically during critical developmental periods. If you see uh, mastiffy type molosser puppies, they're big, dopey, lazy puppies. And so if that switch kicks on for them at seven, eight months, nine months, a year, unless something's there to strongly encourage it, it's outside of critical development, so it drops off the radar, right? And so that's not, so that maturation is such that those dogs usually don't, there are exceptions, usually don't develop a lot of predatory behavior because they didn't get a chance to rehearse it while their brain was developing, right? So for us, when we get puppies and things like that, puppies will mature at very different rates. So you're going along, I mentioned like one of, the, I don't know that I mentioned it in here, but one of the, the last uh, working German Shepherd that I kept myself personally, uh, uh, I bought a puppy from Germany uh, and brought him over and um, he didn't want to do anything for the first six months of his life. He was boring as hell, super unmotivated, didn't want to chase anything, lazy. He was a confident puppy but not interested in doing much, right? I could get him hungry and get him to do stuff with food but he was not super interested in training. And then like right about six, six and a half months, it was like somebody flipped a switch and he went nuts. Like, you waved a rag around one day, and all of a sudden he just went crazy, grabbed it. Like, he went from zero to 100 in one day. <laughs> like, I'm like, wow, that's weird, right? And there are dogs that are like that. So sometimes when we have puppies, we think my puppy's not very motivated, so I need to work to make them motivated. I have to work at it. And we do up to a point. We're going to try to manipulate that. We're going to try to get them doing it. But also you have to let them kind of mature into it naturally. And some puppies won't be very interested as little puppies, but they will turn on to various activities as they get older, right? And so part of all this early stuff is us not trying to force them to do things when they're not developmentally ready for it. And so we can give them opportunities, and we're going to talk about this on Friday when we talk about play and stuff too, but you can give them opportunities to do these things, but you can't make it happen necessarily, right? This is all inducive training. It's all reward-based. And motivation, although we have ways of manipulating it, some of the ways we've talked about already, right? Uh, we can deprive them a little bit of food to make them more hungry. We can find better food. Uh, we can move the food around more, make it a little more dynamic and a little more exciting that way. But if your dog's not into it, they're not into it. You can't browbeat them into being into it. And so we have to watch ourselves a lot with dog training in general, but absolutely with puppies. We have to watch ourselves to make sure we're not trying to force them at a point where they're not ready to do it because you can turn them off to the whole activity. They start to go, this whole training thing stinks, right? And so we don't want to do nothing with our puppies. We want to give them those opportunities, but on top of that, we can't make it happen. So pay special attention to those energetics. And I would argue in the early stages, because we've, we've talked a bit about motivation and the value of motivation, that with all puppies, we're in the motivation building stage. With pre-teething puppies, under four months old, under six months old, we're still in the motivation building stage. And those dogs are not as motivated as they're going to be later on, right?